Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, my background is, my, my background is I've worked in change management for many years. And, um, and as Jan said, my, my focus on the people aspects of change. So I tend to follow the strategy consultancies in as they go and think about strategy and structure. My role is then to think about how do you get people to want to do this. But my frustration over the years is that, that organisations will have big budgets for the strategy and structure, structural consultants, but tiny budgets for the people. And it's often my clients who I work with, we're brought in at the very last moment saying, we've got to think about how we want to restructure. Now can you think about how we communicate this? Now can you think about how we get people involved in this? Very late in the day. And I guess my frustration is, why is it so late in the day? Why has this happened? And I think it's partly because leaders, they, they think they can understand the structure, but people are a bit unpredictable. We don't quite know how they're going to respond to change. They can respond in very different ways. So for me, about five, six years ago, I stumbled across an article by a neuroscientist who said we're beginning to now to know enough about the brain to begin to apply this to organisations and make it practical. So for me, this is real hurrah. At long last, we can bring evidence to change management and to the people aspects of change. And in a way, I think it's built on some of the things we talked about this morning about data and, and metrics around HR. This is about bringing scientific evidence to HR. And not long after I completed some of my studies as a neuroscientist, I was um, running a session for one of the, for the banks, for some leaders in one of the banks, and who, has to be said, are not that interested in employee engagement. They're bankers. It's about banking. Um, so I went and talked the language of neuroscience, about science and about performance. And one of the bankers turned to me during one of the sessions and said, I love this stuff. It's not the usual psycho fluff I get from you HR people. This is science. So I think, so, and for me, whatever gets them there. But if it's a language of science that helps to persuade leaders to do the kind of things we think they need to be doing, then so, then so be it. So that's what my session is about this afternoon. Um, what I'm going to cover is neuroscience and its applications, of which there are now plenty. I'll take a brief look at those. Neuroplasticity, big word, but good news. I'll talk about what that is. Some stuff about the fundamental organising principle of our brains, how they work, some of the basics that we need to understand, and therefore the impact of change on the brain and why our brains are not designed to like organisational change. And then I'll take a look at some, at, at some things that we can do to help people if they're going through change, if they're going through periods of uncertainty, how can we help people, employees focus, get back on track and perform at their best. So that's what I'm going to cover. So a little bit about neuroscience, what is it? At its simplest, it's the study of the nervous system, including the brain. Um, there are now lots of applications of which I've listed, listed some there. All sorts of ways in which it begins to be relevant to, the, to those of us who work in organisations or with organisations. So things like, on the right hand side, storytelling. A lot of organisations now begin to get their leaders and managers to use storytelling. Um, but I talk to a lot of leaders, they say, I'm not quite sure why I'm being asked to do this. Why am I being asked to get out there and tell stories? Well, neuroscience shows why storytelling works better than putting a set of bullet points on a slide in front of you. Because when I put words in the slide in front of you, what that does is activate two parts of your brain that deal with language, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. But what it also activates is the analytical part of your brain. So as I'm talking, you'll be thinking, do I agree with her? Does that sound right to me, what she's saying? But if I were to tell you a story, what neuroscience shows is far more parts of your brain are activated. So if I were to tell you a story about running, the motor cortex that helps you to run would be activated in your brain. So far more parts of the brain are activated. And it's as if the listener is, 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 is with the storyteller going through the same experience. And what neuroscience shows is actually by telling somebody a story, it's a much less confrontational way of planting a new idea in somebody's head. So rather than bombarding people with facts and figures and on, on, on slides, actually telling somebody a story, especially if in that story it's somebody that the person likes, it might be a leader or manager, they're talking about whom they like, and that person has changed their mind during the course of the story, the people are more likely to change their minds. So it shows why things like storytelling can be so useful to us. Things like um, empathy and staying power, there's a neuroscientist called Naomi Eisenberg at UCLA who's done a lot of work showing that if we are in the presence in the lab of an empathetic person, somebody we like, we will try a task for hard, or harder at those tasks and we will stick at them for longer if we're in the presence of an empathetic person. And it begs the question, is that not also true in the organisation? So all sorts of applications, which some of which we'll look at this afternoon. Work has changed hugely and continues to change, but our brains have really not changed that much. Our brains are not that dissimilar from our ancestors who are out in savannah, and that's what our brains are designed for. 
One part of the brain has evolved more, that's the prefrontal cortex, a bit behind your foreheads, where we do our thinking and planning and emotional control, a very important part of the brain for 21st century work. That bit has evolved, but the rest of the brain hasn't. It still pretty much thinks it's out on the savannah. And that's the challenge we have, that we've dropped these, these brains that are designed for the savannah into 21st century workplaces, and then we expect them to function well at, the, and at their best. And so what the brain wants to do, because it thinks it's out of the savannah, it's all about survival. That's the key thing our brains want to do, and they're very good at it, it's why we're all still here today. It's about survival. And to achieve survival, there are two key things the brain wants to do. It wants to minimise threat and seek out rewards. But of the two, it mainly wants to minimise threat, because we can go without shelter, we can go without food, we can even go without water for quite a while. But if the predator got you, game over. That was the end of it. So our brains are much more attuned to looking for threats. And that's true in the savannah. It's true in the workplace as well. That's what they're on the lookout for, is for threats. And because it is about survival, they also want to be able to predict. And just to show you how good your brain is at predicting, just read that. So we can absolutely read it. So what our brains want to do, it's about, I guess, about survival. They want to predict because if they can predict that rustling in the undergrowth might be something threatening to us, then they know how we should respond. So our brains want to predict. They want patterns. That's, that's what the brain likes. So we need to remember that that's what the brains are looking for. So what all that adds up to in terms of change the brain, what does, what does change mean in the organisation? It means we can't predict. We don't know what's going to happen, and the brain likes to predict. So change and ambiguity, when we really don't know what's going, is even worse the brain. The brain doesn't like it. It likes to predict. It likes certainty. So as we go into change and ambiguity, that creates a threat response in our brain, which you'll be very familiar with, fight or flight. That's literally what's going on in the brain. As, as, as the threat response is, is triggered by change, so the blood goes from the parts of the brain where we do our thinking to those parts of the brain that get ready to run away or to fight, and away from the prefrontal cortex where we do our thinking and planning. So a brain that's, that's confronted by change is distracted, is anxious, is fearful. It can't think straight. It wants things to be predictable, and it's, and it's not. Well, that then has an impact on us. Our, our decision-making becomes poorer. We have reduced memory. We have increased anger because we're in this threat state. In fact, neuroscientists say that the brain of an adult going through change is very much like the brain of a, of a teenager. I don't know anyone's around teenagers, got brothers, sisters, or children at home, but it's very volatile, very quick to get angry, angry, very hard to predict, very poor at reading other people's emotions. We start to see the workplace as much more hostile than it really is. When we're in this reality, it's almost like we're looking all through a filter of, of hostility, of threat. So you walk in the morning and you, there's a meeting going on, you've not been invited to it, suddenly that becomes really significant to you. Why have I not been invited to that meeting? What does it mean? We start to see colleagues subconsciously being much more threatening to us because now if there's going to be change, if resources are under threat, then perhaps that colleague now is going to be a competitor to me rather than my, than my, my good colleague. So relationships begin to break down the workplace. Our performance starts to go down. And we know it. We get to the day. We know we haven't done our best work. We know we've been distracted through the day. And so our performance gets even worse as we know we're, we're not performing at our best. So that's the impact of change on the brain. Our brains don't like <laughs> It's change that is unpredictable and uncontrollable. That combination is very stressful to the brain. So I think if people are struggling with change in the organisation, then they shouldn't feel they're being feeble or weak in some way. Our brains don't like it. It's not what they're designed for, especially if they don't have control and they can't predict. This is, um, I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. It isn't time to go through this. This is a model um, about six key things that the brain needs, that the brain likes, um, that, that help go through the model of motivation. It's a useful planning model when we're going through change. Um, it's, it's based originally on, on neuroscience and some work done by, uh, by David Rock, who developed the SCARF model that some of you might be familiar with. But what I was writing in my book last summer, I realized there's a key one he had missed, which is purpose. And our need for a sense of purpose is, is really important. So all six matter to all of us but some matter more to others. Um, so self-esteem is about feeling good, it's about learning and growing, purpose is about having a sense that I come into work and I'm doing something useful, particularly something that's benefiting others. There's some great work done by um, Adam Grant from Wharton University, where he took um, people who were um, fundraising in a, in a college in the States, divided them into two. He got one group to meet the beneficiary of their work, so someone who'd gone through that college in the States as a result of the money they had generated, the other group didn't. 
And what he found, the group that met that beneficiary for just five minutes, their fundraising went up by over 170%, not just into the following week, but even into the following month. So that piece about, I know why I'm doing what I'm doing, and meeting that person, meeting that beneficiary, what a difference it makes to people and to their performance. So purpose. Autonomy is about having some control, just having a perception of some control is hugely important to the brain. We don't want to feel like we're complete victims in a change programme. Certainty I've talked about, our brain's need for certainty, our brain's craving for information. It goes back to survival. If we've got information, we're more likely to make it. Equity is about a sense of having fair treatment. If there's going to be change around here, then our sense of our need for equity for fair treatment goes up because it's going to be, if there's going to be a battle for resources, I want to feel like I'm going to get a fair crack at getting resources that I need and want. And the sixth one is social connection. I'm going to talk about this one a bit in a little bit more detail. So it's our need for relationships at work, which I think is one that organisations have hugely underestimated. Um, and, and though the others, it might be that leaders manage don't feel they can affect certainty or autonomy much, we've all got control over the, uh, the quality of our relationships. So let's just take a look at this in a bit more detail. There's a guy called Matt Lieberman, who's a neuroscientist, done lots of work about the social brain, written a really good book called Social, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Connect, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. And what it's really all about is we are mammals, and from the moment we are born as babies, we would not make it through the first few days and weeks and months of life if there was not somebody on the lookout for us, if someone didn't take an interest in us. So it's deeply rooted in our brains. The need, is somebody interested in me? Does someone care about me? And that carries on throughout life. It carries on through in the organisation as well. And indeed, Matt Lowe, when we, we saw Maslow's hierarchy of needs this morning, Matt Lee won't argue that Maslow got it wrong. Because at the bottom of that list is physiological needs and social connection relationships comes higher up. The argument from neuroscientists is no, social relationships should be at the bottom of that pyramid because we wouldn't get our physiological needs as babies without social connection. We can't survive on our own. So the argument would be, actually, that's the fundamental thing we need. So that Maslow perhaps got it, got it wrong. So... Um, Social connection is really important to us. I think we hugely underestimate it. One well, of the other interesting discoveries about, about social connection, about our brain, how it deals with, with social rejection, that just as we know that paracetamol deals with physical pain, so it also reduces social pain. It, to the brain, social pain, physical pain, it's the same part of the brain that deals with both. It, it doesn't distinguish between the two in quite the same, same way that we think it does. So, para, so it is that real to the brain um, in terms of, of, the, of uh, rejection and pain. So that's it. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a quick canter through it, but say if we have them, we're on the right-hand side. And I know there's lots of different definitions, de definitions of employee engagement. I'm sure Cathy will talk about that later. But to me, you know, somebody on the right-hand side, if we've got all six and we're on that right-hand side, that, that's an engaged employee, someone who's positive, who's focused, who can work at their best. But if we haven't got them, it's that threat state where we're distracted, can't focus, can't work at our best. Six key things that... that um, organisations need to think about when they're planning change and it can be from quite a small thing from planning a difficult phone call planning a meeting right through to planning organisational change to think about the, these six factors and what impact they're having on people and that's it thank you very much